Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's very, uh, let me get some water here. <clears throat> I've been uh, doing quite a bit a lot of, of talking the last few days, and I, I think I'm starting to lose my voice a little bit. So it's very exciting for me to come talk about technology. I've been in the business for almost 30 years. I've been in quite a number of roles in IBM, from uh, uh, manufacturing to research to running our wireless business unit. And I think it's never been a, a more exciting time uh, to be in technology. I'll try to give you a little bit of perspective uh, where technology is, where it's going, and then talk a little bit about how you build a semiconductor ecosystem from our experiences uh, in IBM. And then uh, maybe wrap up by giving you my perspective on what I think would be the potential benefits uh, for India for having a, a semiconductor manufacturing uh, capability. Um, I'm actually here for a different reason in, in, in India and here in Bangalore. <clears throat> We're celebrating the fifth anniversary of our Semiconductor Technology uh, Research and Development Center in, in Bangalore. Um, when I came into this role about five and a half years ago, uh, we recognized that we needed to grow our design enablement capability uh, quite significantly. And you know, given the need from all of our customers for different types of EDA platforms and different types of variations of technology, and we were challenged to find enough skills uh, in the United States to, to staff that activity. And we looked around and we said, uh, you know, we had many people in my team who were from India, and we had a pretty good idea what the skills were uh, that were available here, and we made the decision to come to Bangalore. And we partnered with Pamela Kumar here, who's in the front of this room, and David Harame, who is a second speaker, and we launched the activity. We had no people. Uh, we have actually a giant presence in Bangalore, as I think uh, many people know, a very giant facility here. Uh, but we did not have semiconductor process uh, technology research and development. <clears throat> so we had zero people here five years ago. Uh, I'm very proud of what we did. did. We focused on building very close relationships with universities. Uh, David spent a lot of time visiting all the major university establishing partnerships. Uh, we have had, I think at this point, 15 fellowships uh, that we sponsored for uh, students uh, to pursue uh, advanced degrees. And we've gotten some great talent uh, for the center. It started out doing what I would call older technologies. But let me tell you, I just had a deep dive review today the work that's going on there now is at the leading edge. The team is working on 22, 14 nanometer technology, and it spans a wide range of activities now, you know, from design enablement to uh, TCAD modeling, to characterization yield analysis, uh, to, um, I must be missing, missing one. <coughs> oh, yes, uh, how can I admit, George Heffron, who leads our computational photography group, is in the back, and that's the work to take the designs and translate them into the mass that can achieve the features uh, that we need on the wafer. So we're cel Friday, this Friday, we're celebrating our fifth anniversary. That team has grown substantially. It's now uh, basically over 10% of my organization is now here in Bangalore. Uh, there's some skills that have to be near the fab that we can't you know, put in a remote location, the people who actually work with the tools. But anywhere where we you know, can put people remotely, we put those kind of capabilities here in Bangalore. So let me jump in. As I mentioned, it's a very exciting time. I think we all recognize the explosion in consumer products. And just to quote a few statistics for you, you know, today <clears throat> there's over two billion people who are now accessing the internet. You know, that's a pretty incredible number. But we haven't we tapped we tapped just a fraction, you know, of the world population at two billion. So there's still tremendous growth potential for computing. There's over 4 million billion people that are connected to mobile uh, phones. 30 million devices which have RFID tags on them. They can, can be tracked, can communicate information back to a system that can be used to mo monitor, manage uh, complex systems. If you take all the devices together, there's roughly 1 trillion devices that are connected in some way to the internet, which create what we've coined the phrase Internet of Things. That has gotten to us to a point where we've seen almost a 2x growth just since 2009 in the amount of data that's being transported around the internet. We're up around 225,000 terabytes. That's a tremendous amount. And it's expected to continue to grow you know, at 10x the rate of voice traffic. 
And then finally, if you look at the way our children operate, kids in the 13 to 17 range <coughs> are texting constantly. The estimate is somewhere around 100 per day for each individual child. Uh, cell phones are now used more for data uh, than for calls. And people are using it for browsing the web, listening to music, playing games, getting directions through GPS, and of course, sending email and text. Uh, it's expected to provide basically all the functions that you might need in a handheld device. GPS systems are now being integrated, MP3 players, digital cameras. We took a lot of great pictures this week as we, as we toured uh, India. Uh, they did a survey of college students. <clears throat> and what are the most important things in your life that are absolutely essential? And one out of every three kids, or college kids, put the internet as up in the top five. This is along with air, water, food, and shelter. <laughs> Which shows how important it is. And I, I don't know if you have teenagers, but you know, to get them to pay attention to a conversation and not be texting or doing something on, the, on a phone is a real challenge these days. If uh, Facebook were a country, it would be the third largest country in the world behind, uh, guess what, behind <laughs> India. So just giving an example of the, how prevalent the use of, of the internet is today. And it's not just about email and texting and things like that. It's for real valuable applications, such as health healthcare. There are now healthcare mobile applications where, uh, where doctors can actually monitor the, the, um, the status of their patients, and actually patients can send information back to their doctors for real-time uh, diagnosis or treatment of chronic uh, disease situations. How has this all happened? It's the result of an exponential growth in computing. This chart shows how much $1,000 would buy uh, in terms of computations per second, not over the last few years, but this is over the last century. And going back to the mechanical era, we've seen 13 orders of magnitude improvement in the cost of computing. And that's been accelerating as we've gotten into the integrated circuits era, where it's gone up by six orders of magnitude. I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to even imagine that, that kind of number. So I try to put it in some context that I think we can all relate to. If the automobile industry was as good as the chip technology industry, we wouldn't be worrying about gas prices today because gasoline would be close to six, we'd be getting six million kilometers per liter uh, out of a tank of gas. What's fueled this growth is really about economics. So of course it starts out, you've got to invest in research and development. Uh, if you look at the last 10 years, we've seen about a 4x increase in the investment in R&D in the semiconductor industry. What that's driven is about a 10x improvement in the cost per function. And by getting that additional functionality in the cell phones, in the smartphones, and whatnot, it's driven this explosion in consumer purchases. We've seen over the last decade about 400 time increase in the consumption of consumer products. You take 100x cost per function, 400x growth, and what you get is about a 4x increase in the revenue for the semiconductor industry. That goes back into fueling that cycle. <clears throat> now, that's, uh, let me just highlight here some examples of the products uh, that this thing has driven. And I show quite a range of products, and you know, three of the biggest segments are really in the consumer space. So wireless communications, the consumer electronics, things like games, things like TV tuners, for example, and then wired communication, which hooks it all together, you know, it's basically, for us, for, IB, for IBM, in fact, it, that's about 70% of the market that we're going after. If you look at it in total in 2011, it's over $16 billion, and you can see the tremendous growth that's happened just over the last uh, two years. If we look at the technologies that you would need to be able to play in these different spaces, that's highlighted in this chart. So there are several technologies that I'll hi highlight here. Cust custom processors, think of that as the unique processors that go in the games consoles, like the Sony uh, PlayStation, like Microsoft Xbox, like the Nintendo Wii. You then got custom logic. Uh, we call that ASICs. Uh, this is typically high performance, custom type uh, applications. 
Uh, that's typically used in, in the backhaul. It's used in, in the mobile wireless core networks. And it, actually, we use it in our server uh, technologies as well. Really exploding area, which Dave will talk about more, is specialty foundry. This is analog mixed signal RF. And you can create many derivatives off of a base technology, such as high voltage applications, power amplifiers, things like that that might go into the cell phone. And those play in, in the Internet of Things. They're required for this wireless communication from smartphones to smart lighting, smart appliances, uh, smart surveillance. Uh, we have our common platform technology. Think of this as the technologies that the foundries offer in very high volume. Those get used in the, as a baseband processor, typically for wireless handsets. They get used from graphics processors, applications such as that. And then at the very high end, uh, IBM systems use very high performance technologies. We use SOI uh, for making our high performance uh, server applications. And this just shows some examples uh, that we have from an IBM perspective, starting at the high end. You know, we've got the Watson computer system, which can uh, basically access gigantic amounts of data, be able to process it to come up with solutions to problems. Uh, one of the key applications is in the medical arena. Uh, we've given it symptoms. We work with doctors and medical centers to see how we can apply this to be better diagnose uh, patient problems. We've given it symptoms, and I, I would say in almost every case, it's able to beat the doctors in figuring out what the problem is uh, with the patient. We, of course, have our big mainframe computers, which are used in very high uh, computing applications, such as banks, cloud computing, et cetera, and really supercomputers, which are the blue gene systems which have been at the leading edge. Go back to the, the very low end of, I wouldn't say low end of technology, but the very low end in terms of consumer applications, is the cell phone or the smartphone. And there we've seen an explosion in the use of silicon technology. And Dave is going to get into that, but I just highlight, you know, from an IBM perspective and our partners, you know, we've seen a huge growth in our, in our, in the, in our uh, revenue in the area of cell phone applications because of the ability to move and integrate more function and achieve the performance requires in these very uh, new applications can leverage RF CMOS, RF SOI, silicon germanium, high voltage CMOS, as Dave will talk about in his talk. This just shows a couple of examples using this uh, leading, leading edge technology, 32 nanometer, high key metal gate with the power and the performance and the density that it enables, we're able to make basically handheld devices that have tremendous computing power. 